In this video, I shall talk about the latest guidelines on the diagnosis and management of neurocystic psychosis in children. These include the Association of Child Neurology Consensus Guidelines 2021 and the Clinical Practice Guidelines by the Infectious Diseases Society of America and the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene 2017. What we already know till date is that the most common clinical presentation of MCC in children is seizures, which are usually focal or focal onset. The diagnosis is mainly by neuroimaging, that is CT head or MRI brain. For treatment, there are mainly three drugs. First is steroids, which is required to decrease cerebral edema and they are continued for approximately two weeks. Then antiparasitic therapy, which is started 48 to 72 hours after starting steroids to prevent massive hyperinflammatory reaction and mass effect. This is continued for 7 to 14 days, rather 10 to 14 days. And still older guidelines like when we were residents mentioned that it can be continued for up to 28 days in multiple cystic agar. And then there are anti-epileptic drugs, the most common being carbamazepine in India, also oxcarbazepine. But we are not very clear on the follow-up. What Nelson 21st edition says is largely based on IDSA and ASTMH 2017 guidelines, but the same are not tailor-made for the Indian population. Likewise, the AOCN guidelines has not defined the management in patients of NCC at unusual sites, and hence I have combined all these for a better understanding in this video. The first thing is that a routine screening of family members of children with NCC is not recommended. If at all screening is performed, fecal testing can be done for the family for OVA and cyst. Serological tests like enzyme-linked immunoelectroblot transfer and enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay is not recommended for diagnosis and clinical decision-making in children with NCC. Now one can go either for CT head or an MRI brain in a patient with suspected NCC. The neuroimaging features characteristic of an NCC are scolex, which is the most definitive evidence. NCC is usually solitary with a well-defined rim. It is usually small size, less than 2 cm, has mild perilesional edema. The typical location is grey white matter junction or basal ganglia. They are mostly peripheral. Multiple lesions can be seen in different stages also. Like some may be cystic, some may be ring enhancing, some may be calcified. On the other hand, tuberculoma does not show scolex or different stages obviously. It is more than 2 cm in size, has thick irregular walls, has marked perilesional edema. This is an important difference which might be associated even with midline shift that is mass effect posing a clinical danger to the child. These are closer to the midline and the radiology also, radiology also shows the associated features of basal meningitis. Currently I don't have the CTMRI pictures of either of these lesions but diagrammatically it so appears that NCC is usually peripheral in location they can be single or multiple, but they are well defined with a usually less than 2 cm. The rim is thin and you can see scolex in most of them. On the other hand, tuberculoma, it is relatively central in location, larger size, has thick irregular walls and it has marked perilesional edema. You can see in this diagrammatic representation that the midline has already shifted towards the left. This is referred to as midline shift and it can lead to massive cerebral edema, marked raised ICT and a risk of impending herniation and even death. Most of the time, if a CT head has been performed, which is the case in India, as most of the parents are not affordable for getting an MRI brain, an MRI brain is usually not required after a CT head. But an MRI brain would still be required even if a CT head has been performed and it is suggestive of NCC. If at all, there are atypical imaging features like conglomerate lesions, subarachnoid or intraventricular lesions 
along with the absence of scolex. CT features creating suspicion of intraventricular subarachnoid or intraspinal in CC and atypical clinical features like meningitis, signs of meningitis, encephalopathy, vision loss, fleeting headache, stroke-like features and behavioral changes. Additional MR sequences for example magnetic resonance spectroscopy or magnetization transfer imaging may also be done seldomly. For example, the MRS of a tuberculoma will show elevated lipids, elevated choline creatinine ratios and elevated choline and style aspartate ratios. On the other hand, MRS and NCC would be suggestive of elevated acetate succinate ratio. These are sometimes asked in the practical examination from some of the residents. If the resident is performing very well, your viva can go up to this level also. <clears throat> The magnetization transfer ratio of the hyperintense rim of the ring enhancing lesion is significantly lower for tuberculomas compared to NCC and this is due to high lipid content in them. Now these are technical radiological terms, they aren't very essential to be known by the general pediatricians except uh, in cases of exam for the pediatric residents. So MRS or MTI should be used as supportive evidence only. If there is a doubt between an NCC and tuberculoma on conventional MRI. Also, if the initial imaging does not differentiate NCC from tuberculoma, a repeat contrast enhanced MRI is required at an interval of 6 to 8 weeks from the initial MRI to look for the interval change or even earlier if it is indicated by worsening or new clinical symptoms or signs. Now if a patient is already on treatment for a single or multiple lesions, a repeat MRI should be done after a minimum of 6 months or earlier as guided by worsening or new clinical symptoms or signs. Rather, it, rather IDSA and ASTMH suggest that a repeat MRI should be done every 6 months until the cystic component has resolved completely. Now from the therapeutic point of view, there are four radiological stages of NCC. The vesicular, the colloid vesicular and the granular nodular stages are the viable stages. The nodular calcified stage is a non-viable stage. What is the importance is that antiparasitic therapy is used for the treatment of viable cysts only and it is not required for the management of nodular calcified stage. Management of intraparenchymal NCC is basically the same as given in Nelson's 21st edition that is a single viable cyst will require 10 to 14 days of albendazole therapy. More than two viable cysts will require a combination of albendazole and praziquant for 10 to 14 days and persistent lesions. Persistent lesions are lesions persisting for 6 months after the initial course of therapy. You remember you have to repeat the neuroimaging after 6 months of starting treatment. In that case you might do retreatment with any one of the above two options depending on the number in the same dose and duration. Now albendazole and praziquantel are antiparasitic that is cysticidal drugs both of which have a different mechanism of action. And hence, for more than two viable cysts, a combination of the two is preferred. But albendazole, if we see if we see, if we see the two drugs individually, albendazole has a better efficacy than praziquantel and should be used alone for a single viable cyst. But one must not forget to get a fundus examination done prior to starting treatment with antiparasitic drugs to rule out ocular NCC, which would then cause hyperinflammation and a serious threat to vision. Calcified parenchymal NCC, the most common initial imaging is CT. You can easily diagnose on CT, but an MRI brain might be required after CT if the child has persistent seizures or hydrocephalus. Treatment is symptomatic only. This is very important. No antiparasitic drugs and no steroids are required even if mild perilesional edema is present. Intraventricular NCC are best diagnosed with MRI with 3D volumetric sequencing. The medical management usually comprises of perioperative steroids, 
antiparasitic therapy should be added if surgical removal is not possible. The surgical management for lateral and third ventricle NCC is minimally invasive neuroendoscopy and antiparasitic drugs should be avoided in the pre-op period. For fourth ventricle, it is a definitive surgery. The subarachnoid NCC requires high dose steroids to reduce inflammation. Rather, methotrexate can be used as a steroid sparing agent because in these patients, sometimes steroids have to be continued for a very long duration. So, so there might be potential steroid toxicity. Antiparasitic therapy also needs to be given until there is radiological resolution of the viable cystic zircai, which may take even up to a year. So for these patients, you must remember that whenever albendazole is given for more than 14 days, one must monitor for leukopenia and hepatotoxicity. Shunt surgery with surgical debulking may be required in those with hydrocephalus. Spinal NCC requires corticosteroids in those with associated clinical spinal dysfunction, for example, paraparesis or incontinence. They also require antiparasitic therapy. Ocular NCC requires surgical removal rather than antiparasitic therapy. Now the main pathophysiology in NCC is the host immune reaction to the degenerating cysts. The resulting perilesional edema can have devastating consequences including cerebral herniation. So pulse IV steroids are used to reduce acute symptomatic edema in cysticircle encephalitis and subarachnoid neurocysticircosis. This can either be methylprednisolone dosage 10 to 30 mg per kg for 3 to 5 days or dexamethasone 3 to 6 mg per kg per day for 3 to 5 days. There is no role of routine anti seizure prophylaxis until the patient has seizures as per these guidelines. But if you have started the anti epileptic drug, you can consider starting tapering of the anti epileptic drugs after the end of 6 months in a single ring enhancing lesion which resolves on follow-up after 6 months should be continued for approximately 24 months in those with persistent lesions, calcification or multiple lesions and sometimes even for more than 24 months in children with evidence of calcification, persistent cyst or history of more than 2 seizures in the past. But before tapering you must remember the risk factors for recurrence and you should be very cautious and use your clinical acumen whenever you are deciding to tapering the anti-epileptic drugs in patients with NCC. So the risk factors for recurrence are residual cystic lesions, calcifications, breakthrough seizures and more than two seizures in the past. Hydrocephalus requires surgical management and epilepsy surgery workup should be considered in children with NCC who have failed two appropriately chosen anti-epileptic drugs tried in optimal doses. So to summarize, what is not recommended is a routine screening of contacts, serological tests for diagnosis and clinical decision making, routine anti-epileptic drug profile access, antiparasitic therapy and steroids in calcified cysts. What else I have discussed is are the indications for repeat neuroimaging and additional MR sequences, management of intraparenchymal, calcified parenchymal, intraventricular, subarachnoid, spinal and ocular neurocystic sarcosis, and pulse IV steroids are to be used in acute symptomatic cerebral edema of cystic circle encephalitis. Here I have summarized the treatment in various types of NCC. You can see them in leisure. Thank you so much for a very patient listening and please do share the knowledge. Thank you.